questions, this is a good time for question and answer. We'll be doing it for uh, 15 to 20 minutes if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, we will be having a reception at the Cary Street Cafe immediately following this event where we will be buying or pulling our raffle ticket winners. So if you want to find out if you won, uh, I looked over them. It looks like everyone put their contact information in case you don't make it. But um, that's where we will be drawing the winners. And we will be selling other stuff there as well. So we hope to see you all there. Does anyone have any questions? anybody else. They're not all scared of it. A lot of them are starting to listen. I think we do need to start approaching them. I think we need to start making uh, public service announcements, telling them what marijuana can do for them. All the different things. Anything from itchy scalp to glaucoma to cancer treatments, they're the ones who are suffering. And I think they will listen. The other thing is, one thing senior citizens don't want to hear is that they're not independent. They're already feeling bad about getting older, and they've got their kids taking away their, you know, their their um, driver's license and their car keys. I think one of the ways to reach them is to say, hey, it's your body, and you can do what you want to do with your body. And there are other treatments out there besides the ones that the doctors are talking about, and you can do something about that. I think there is, but we're, nobody seems, your, your organization and also uh, the drug policy elements, nobody wants to talk to senior citizens. The AARP is a very strong lobby in this country. If we started advertising and doing public service announcements, I think we could start getting people and then we just wake up. If we got them on our side, things would happen. No, no, we got a bunch of questions. We've spoken. Get the audience to speak. Uh, you asked where there were lottery tickets. The lottery tickets are immediately outside the door at the table. They're five bucks a piece. There's someone standing by to take your money, even as we speak. <laughs> uh, I just want to cover your point really quickly regarding senior citizens. And Keith isn't here, unfortunately, and he had to leave early to answer that. But it is something that we've discussed at the national office. It's definitely a demographic that needs to be reached out to. My mom is a baby boomer, and she keeps telling me as well, you know, do the AARP thing, go for that demographic. And I know in California they're working on it. They're a big push for medical in there, but it is definitely something on the radar and we should probably focus more on it. So, thank you for that point. Sophia, what I suggest is, but have, have, a, have, you know, rather than sort of interrupting, let's get a lot of comments and questions from the audience, and then we'll respond, you know, I mean, I think that, that, that we want to hear from now from the audience. Uh, this is for any of you lawyers, because I was, uh, civil rights worker in Mississippi in 1964, so I'm especially interested in the racial aspects of the law. John talked a lot about the arrest. My understanding is that the discrimination doesn't stop with the arrest, but that a black person arrested for a drug crime is much more likely to end up in jail than a white person arrested for a drug crime. I just wondered if you have any information on that. We'll get to that, yes. Next, next person. Ask the microphone to the next person. Uh, this is very early. Um, I really like the comment you brought about your pamphlet on uh, businesses and how they're affected by uh, marijuana prohibition. I was wondering uh, if you could touch a little bit more on that and how that campaign is going and uh, what kind of responses you've gotten from businesses um, locally and, and if you've touched on uh, national. Um, I just had a question 
about, um, it's kind of a matter of public policy. So we hear how many people are in prison for marijuana use, and you know, it's like a, an extraordinary number. Um, and I am also of the belief that within my lifetime, I'll see marijuana legalized. Um, so I assume that those prisoners and whatnot will be released. Has there been any thought to like public policy as to any kind of societal like reintegration for those people? Because I'm sure their imprisonment has ruined their lives. Professionals have their lives ruined, the credibility taken away, doctors took their licenses. Um, has there been any thought of that just to kind of avoid a, uh, shall we say, mission accomplished uh, scenario? about how marijuana can help them. Is that what you're saying? Yes, especially with medical ailments. Yeah. From medical ailments, exactly. Hi, my name is Michael Harvey. I'm from uh, the Ruther Glen area. And um, first, I want to say we're pretty fortunate to have all you guys join us today. It's been a very educational uh, <laughs> time. We have the idea right. Um, a question I do have, um, and it, 
it may not be able to be answered today, but uh, as has been mentioned, you know, the movement can change things with small groups. Uh, my question is, what areas uh, in Virginia, what counties are more aware than others so that the counties that aren't necessarily getting the awareness raised in their town, uh, we can bring that to their attention um, and have conferences like this to help raise the awareness. Because if you, if you raise the awareness in one or two, three, four counties, that's gonna do some good, but if you can get multiple counties across the state uh, to create an overall awareness, so I, I definitely believe it'll make a significant change. So I just was curious uh, if not today, um, something on the Virginia Normal site, where we're missing now uh, in moving forward with the movement. So, good question. As, as a Northern Virginia resident, I was wondering uh, how would one go about trying to, in that area, which is highly conscious, or I'd say the, the police presence. Because in that area, you will be scrutinized for going about giving you all the shirts and trying to give out information. I mean, you will be harassed if you live in Fairfax County and found out, trust me, you will be harassed if you're trying to go around informing people about uh, legalization and the movement towards legalization and decriminalization. Do you have any suggestions on how to maybe go about doing that in a conservative area? Well, let's, let's, let's start with that because that's actually a very easy question to address. Uh, don't have any marijuana in your possession. Uh, a, a lot of marijuana arrests, I mean, the... the Maybe it's a sign of the thing that the lawyer made earlier about just being high in general or not that you would. Maybe I had a question actually about walking. Let's say you're high, really high, and noticeably high. <laughs>
leave a bag of pot in a, in a backpack in plain sight in the back seat. Um, we get very casual about marijuana use, and frankly, even the numbers I rattled off, when you actually compare arrests to marijuana usage, they might arrest one, two, three percent of marijuana users, if that. So a lot of people are sort of comfortable thinking they're not threatened by uh, law enforcement action, and then they get a little sloppy and casual and get themselves vulnerable to that. So to separate your, 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 your personal activity from your public activity, and um, you should be in good shape. I also had a side question that I thought was really important to address. I wonder, people who are busted because of marijuana, how often does that lead them into a life of, or into more crime-related activity? How often do it, it doesn't. I was just wondering if there were any statistics. Uh, it's actually one of these things about proving a negative. You know, there isn't really any credible data marijuana use leads to a life of crime. It, it works saying? backwards. This is what analysis works backwards. If you look at the population of people in prison for felonies, you will find 60-70% of them or greater have some kind of drug use in their background. Uh, you also find alcohol use in their background. But it's not that the marijuana use caused the other activity. It's that marijuana use is popular amongst a lot of people, including those who have been involved in crime. It's not the use rather than the arrest. Let's, why don't you hold now, you, you, um, let's address some of the questions that have been asked. Are there, is there another question that has not yet been asked? Then should we start down here, Robert, uh, and uh, some of the others? I'd, I'd like to comment on the question about raising awareness in, in, in uh, uh, counties that don't have the support. And this is something I, I neglected to say earlier, but it's something that, for me, is cause for optimism. Uh, earlier this summer, um, the House Courts of Justice Chair, Delegate, uh, David Alba was quoted in the media saying that 75% of House members agree with him on a modest uh, change in marijuana laws. That's huge. 75% are a bit of a modest change. And HB 1134 is potentially just a modest change. It, the, 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 uh, the, the courts of justice, they did not like the reduction in penalties for, for, for distribution. But if that bill was just limited to um, possession and um, uh, basically a green light for personal use cultivation of five plants. I mean, that alone could put the cartels out of business in the state of Virginia. Um, so one small change could, could really make a big difference on, on the landscape. It would close the gateway to hard drugs because there would be no large-scale mar mar marijuana distribu distribution of common anymore. So I'm optimistic. Um, yeah, there are a couple I'd like to talk about. One is, is that um, someone right in here asked about people being released from prison marijuana or legalized or something of that nature. Um, the basic rule on that is, is if the law gets repealed, it does not mean the people that are currently serving time on it get released. Um, there has to be a special rule that is then allowed that. And so the people that are serving out sentences for any crime finish the sentence even if it gets repealed. Um, just as a quick example of when that doesn't, not the case, is that people have probably heard about how they changed the crack versus cocaine disparity in federal court was a big issue for decades. In, in that situation, we specifically decided that it would apply retroactively, meaning that people can go back. No, 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 no. S 1789 was not retroactive. Okay, so there, there was a change in the sentencing guidelines a couple of years ago, and they made the, the sentencing commission then made the change in the sentencing guidelines retroactive. Okay. About 10,000 people were sent resentenced. But that was not a change in the statute. Okay, it was, that, that makes perfect sense. And in any event, that needed to be something that was specific because the general way that works is you finish your sentence even if they change the law after you got convicted. Um, on the piece that the law student asked about uh, the search and seizure issue, I can't see. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Basically, to, to oversimplify it, you probably already know a lot of this is that you know, police on the street need probable cause to either arrest you or to search you. There's a case in Virginia that basically says that if you smell the odor of marijuana around a person, such as it's close enough to their person to seem to be coming from just that person, that that is probable cause. So therefore, that technique is very often used, as you think you said, you might have seen it work to, to search a person. Um, as to a car, if someone is arrested, then through various channels, one way or another, police can usually end up searching the whole car. The rules are kind of complicated, but that, that's what I was talking about there. So I think if you talk to 
a lot of police officers, especially the ones that work in a high crime area, they will tell you this is a tool that we, that we need to be able to get these searches done because they have their ideas to try to protect the community. So I, I was mentioning that um, I think that's one of the big fears of outright legalization. Um, one thing I wanted to put my final thing was you talked about cars and the police and being high and so forth. Um, you can be arrested in Virginia for being intoxicated in public, even and not in a car, if, if there's a problem cause to believe that. With alcohol, it's pretty simple. The person stumbling down the street smells like alcohol, and police routinely arrest people for that. Be a little harder with marijuana. You're less likely to be stumbling down the street. Uh, there's not a BAC machine they can use just for that. They would get blood tests. So in that situation, I would suggest to you that the main thing to do is to be polite and don't you don't have to say anything. You can merely be polite. You're under no obligation to admit it if a police officer asks you that you have to smoke marijuana. If you say yes, you could be arrested. Um, if, as for driving, the final thing on that, um, there's a driving while intoxicated law that covers any kind of intoxication, um, even including abuse of prescription drugs or anything like that. So it, it is harder to prove than drunk driving um, because they need to do a blood test Sometimes the timing's not quite clear. There are more defenses to it, but still, it has always been and continue to be illegal, just like DUI to drive after smoking marijuana. And in my experience in court, if there's any sign of impairment at all, there always is a sign of impairment because the police will always say that you did not perform the test correctly and so forth. And the judge knows that you have been smoking it. You're not going to, you're going to most likely lose the case, unlike with alcohol, where if you had a couple of beers, but you're okay. This, not so much. So, final point: cars are cars are the worst place to be in dealing with any kind of illegal activity. They always get searched. If you felt the absolute need to carry marijuana across town, the safest good place to put it is in the trunk. And again, you don't have the obligation to answer any questions, and you should just be polite. Chris, can I? Um. Well, sorry. Really quickly on that note, I have. I'm passing out a normal foundation freedom cards that list your Fourth Amendment rights and gives you a little script of what to say to a police officer if he does stop you. So if you don't already have one, please come see me and I have one. Thanks, Sophia. How many of you have seen the video busted? It should be 100%. Does anybody want to tell, anybody here who saw busted want to give a short synopsis to those who haven't? This is, not you. This is, this is the best thing for young people to get a 45 minute complete education in how to deal with the cops, how to protect yourself, how to avoid getting busted. It's put out by the Flex Your Rights Foundation. You can go to their website, just Google busted, and you can get a copy. They have a new piece called 10 Rules for Dealing with Police, that especially is uh, advice for uh, Africa people of color who, and, and the encounters they have with police. But there's a lot of very good training out there. There's certain magic words you should, lose, you should learn, and those two videos, you'll, you'll crack up watching them. They're well done, they're done by young people, and they're written for young people. I think you'll have a great time busted or ten rules for dealing with police. Okay, uh, I have a couple things I want to say. First of all, on your question here about uh, the problem of cause. Uh, every year in the General Assembly, there are usually three or four bills that I'm concerned about because if they pass, more people will get their cars searched and marijuana will be found more often. And one of them is the seatbelt bill. If you're not wearing your seatbelt, you can't get pulled over unless there's another infraction. Uh, they, and they whittle away at that every year. Now children have to have their seat belts fastened and, or they can pull you over or, and so that, you know, they, 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 that that is an area I'm concerned every year that if they pass that bill that they can pull you over just for not having your seat belt fastened. Now I want you to wear your seat belt, but what I don't want is a whole bunch of kids to get searched because they work. And then there are, there's the stop and frisk. You know, the cops are always trying to get the rights 
to stop you and, and look at, at you and, or, and search you under more and more liberal circumstances. And one of the things is that they're, they're, uh, that comes back every year is a bill which requires that, or that allows police to arrest in a much broader a range of circumstances instead of just giving you a summons for a misdemeanor, which once you're arrested, you can be searched. And you know, right now they have to be able to say, well, I think that if that person didn't get arrested, they would keep, either keep committing the crime or they would not show up in court and I have some reason, I can, I can, something I can base that on. But every year this bill gets introduced to say, no, the cop doesn't have to say that, they can just arrest what they think they should. And I every think that's year very, we very kill bad. that bill. Huh? I said, and every year we kill that Damn right we do, Roy. And that's what we're all about is killing sh bad stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say to you over here uh, about, yeah, would you, are you on Facebook? Yeah, I'm never. never, never. Uh -huh. There's a guy, Matthew John Hammett, on Facebook. And he loves to coach people like you on how to be cool and how to lobby and how to stick up for your First Amendment rights. And he's our Northern Virginia uh, coordinator. So Matthew John Hammett on Facebook, if you get on Facebook and make friends with him, he'd love to give you all kinds of advice. And he's hooked up with me. And if he thinks he can't give you advice, he'll just refer you over to me. So that's a good thing. Now on old people, I are one almost. And you know, I'll tell you, I think that my feeling about it is that the marijuana legalization movement is, is getting great. And just looking at us, I'm, well, Robert, you know, this end of the table excluded. We, we, I think we are getting to be seniors ourselves. And I think that med medical marijuana is a major reason why people do need to be concerned about it, particularly seniors. And uh, for you, you need to know about patients out of time. It's a Virginia uh, medical advocacy group. Uh, they're out of Howardsville, Virginia. You can Google them. Uh, Medicalcannabis.com. Yeah, oh, that, that's right. Thanks, John. And that's the group that, and they're, uh, they're not only seniors who run that group, but they're retired military. And when we were having, they had a conference up in Rhode Island at the same time, the wounded American veterans were of, the, of Rhode Island were having a conference, and you wouldn't believe how those two groups got along. It was really cool. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities there we need to be pursuing them, and we try. And, and about doing local stuff in different uh, areas. You organize a meeting in your county and give me a call, and I'll come. All right. Information on medical cannabis. Um, two great sources. First of all, Patients Out of Time, as Linus has mentioned, uh, was probably one of the best sources for info on medical cannabis. Uh, one of the principals there, Raylan Mathry, is a registered nurse. Uh, second of all, uh, Normal website, normal.org, uh, has a section on medical cannabis. Uh, for one thing, you can get a, a, a description of each of the state laws in the 14 uh, medical cannabis states and what conditions are authorized in each of those individual states but there's also excellent background information there about the, about the issue in general and about the particular medical conditions that medical cannabis has been associated with.
not for that crime. Uh, most people who are, who are arrested do get probation. There are lots of people in prison for violation of probation. And they're in violation of probation because they come back with a dirty urine. If you are on probation and parole and you're going to be drug tested, don't get stoned. And that's, you know, you have to give it up or you're going to go to jail that way. When the DEA says that um, uh, the numbers are wrong, that's typical DEA bullshit. The numbers that John gives, the numbers that the FBI put out are arrests, and these are arrests for civil possession. This is before anybody goes to court. This has nothing to do with a plea bargain. This is typical DEA crap. Now the number, many, what they are suggesting is that people who are, that convictions, marijuana convictions for civil possession are drug dealers who have pled down. No, that's not typically the case. The government doesn't make those kinds of, if, if you are a genuine dealer, there's enough quantity, they will work some kind of a deal perhaps, but you're still gonna end up with some kind of felony drug possession, drug trafficking conviction. But they overcharge. They don't, DEA doesn't tell you how often the local police, you have three bags of pot in your backpack few grams in each, and they charge you as a, with felony distribution or possession with intent to distribute, because you have, you know, you have, well, this is some of your indica, and this is some of your tequila, and this is what your brother gave you. you know? And, you know, well, you're not a dealer, but, you know, some party ass cop wants to give you a felony ticket. And yes, you know, the prosecutor says, well, okay, I'll, I'll take the blee bar on that, because it's a bullshit uh, prosecution for distributing. You know, so, the, you know, so DA's, you know, it's typical DA crap. Yeah, I want to add to that. Yeah, and I want to echo what Eric has said here. The typical thing is, is that the person is overcharged. Now, I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a person in this room who was charged with having something like four pounds when, in fact, it was four ounces. Am I correct? I, I really think this is a true story. So, you know, I, I think that, that this is the ridiculous kind of assertion that they've bargained it down. What they've done is they've actually gotten the charges down into the zone where they somewhat relate to the reality of the situation. They, they, the cops are always exaggerating. And that is a, uh, and that, um, okay, let me just say, that pisses me off. <laughs> okay. But they always do. They always do. And, and on that, I have an important piece. Let's say somebody is, you get stopped, somebody gets stopped with an ambiguous amount of marijuana, let's say less than an ounce. It could be that you were going to sell it, it could be that you wouldn't. A good police officer will try to get that from you by asking you innocent sounding questions, such as, when you get to share this with your friend in the seat next to you here? If you give a yes to that, it's still a bullshit case, but you just technically admitted to possession with intent to distribute. A felony. Um, if it's an ounce, if it's over a half an ounce, yes. Um, our favorite one in the office is the guy who thought he could talk his way out of, a, out of it by saying that he wasn't going to use the drugs himself, he was going to use it to get a hooker. Contention is straight now. So, like, like I said before, be polite and don't say, be polite and don't answer the questions. Yeah, th that, this can't be, I mean, you may not see the movie busted or whatever. Let, if you are stopped by a police officer, you answer no questions except your name. You don't have to say where you're going, where you're coming from. Don't, and you simply say, am I free to go? Am I free to go? Are you detaining me or am I free to go? You don't have to answer any questions. And the thing is, don't answer any questions. Don't answer any questions. That's what your lawyer is telling you. Don't answer any questions. You're not, they will, they will say, do you, uh, you know, here's one I just heard from the sheriff in Mendocino uh, when I was in San Francisco last month. Um, you don't have any bazookas or uh, explosives in the car, do you? And the guy says, no, no. no. Well, oh, you don't mind if we search then, do you? <laughs> and, well, I don't have any bazookas in my car. I don't have any rockets. Well, he's in Mendocino. What does he have in the back of the car? <laughs> and then let me amplify a point that, that, that Chris made.
Transferring marijuana from one individual to another is distribution. You're not generally going to get a distribution charge from someone at a party passing a joint. However, I was just testifying as a, as a defense witness uh, on marijuana usage in, in, a, in a trial in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is, to be very quick about this, uh, a gentleman ordered a mushroom kit for the mail. Perfectly legal product, but the delivery man took it to the local police department. They got a search warrant. They searched the house. They found three pounds of marijuana. Husband, wife, and son visiting from college were all arrested and charged with trafficking offenses. Part of the accusation in the trial was that this three pounds of marijuana was, was far, far more marijuana than anyone could possibly consume in the course of a year. They go, <laughs> they go uh, okay, uh, their reasoning, a joint is a half a gram, and so ignoring the fact that there are seeds and stems that people roll larger joints, they, they calculated this produced some two or three thousand joints, and that would keep someone high for 24 hours a day for 200 days, and, and nobody smokes that much pot. Well, uh, we provided a, a factual case to the, to the, oh, and by the way, the wife and this family had glaucoma, and that's one of the reasons why she wouldn't use marijuana quite frequently, and that's one of the reasons why her husband made sure there was marijuana in the house for her, and that's why he was growing six plants, to have marijuana for his wife for her glaucoma. Well, we presented a factual defense. Again, I'm just a, a witness in this trial. The defense attorney did, did a very good job. Uh, the problem is that, that the husband admitted that, yes, he got marijuana to give to his wife. And we established that they weren't really selling marijuana. It wasn't packaged for sale. There was no other evidence of sales. And here's the verdict from the jury. Jury, by the way, very conscientious, very detailed in their instructions. as rural, western Pennsylvania. Uh, the son was acquitted of all charges. The wife was found guilty of possession and also a conspiracy count because she knew about the marijuana being grown in the house. Uh, but basically, we managed to get those two individuals away from very severe men, very severe mandatory minimum sentences. The husband was convicted of intent to deliver and is facing a two-year mandatory sentence simply because he acknowledged he had marijuana that he was intending to give to his wife. Even though this is a, you know, you hear about spousal privilege and confidence, sanctity of marriage. Just the fact that he got marijuana to give to his wife, he was convicted of a trafficking offense. Now, that is the letter of the law. One would hope that most juries would, would say this really doesn't apply. But that is the law. And from a prosecutor's standpoint, and as Chris said, from a police officer's standpoint, just mentioning something as innocent that, you know, I got this from my wife, I got this from my boyfriend, even something like, I got this from my sick mother, that is distribution under the law. Robert, Chris, Lettuce, any last words? I, I, I want to close on, just respond to one of the points. No, but I'm, I'm open to talk to everybody. Who wants to one of the questions was asked uh, was about discrimination post arrest. In other words, John laid out the racial discrimination proportionality in arrests. This does carry through. Um, nationwide data, um, this is not marijuana, this is uh, criminal, uh, criminal cases generally, that, um, excuse me, in drug cases, uh, about one third of the whites who are convicted uh, get uh, probation. Hold on, just what? Two thirds of the whites convicted got probation. One, one third of the blacks got probation. Of those who went to prison, the average sentence that the blacks got was a year longer on average than the average sentence the whites got. The, so that I mean, this kind of discrimination magnifies going going through the system. The last thing I just want to say is this: um, we've alluded, you know, to the civil rights movement in the '60s. I was in high school from '60. To 67. I was not involved in the civil rights movement. In the period from 68 to 72 was the war in Vietnam, and I was very involved in the, uh, in the fight against the war in Vietnam. I did not disparage my friends who were drafted. I don't dishonor the memory of Richie Schmidt, who I played, you know, who was in my neighborhood, who was killed in Vietnam. But I was a resistor, and I'm proud of having been a resistor. The question for you as students now is, you can do the 60s right. It doesn't have to be about bombing Roxy buildings. It doesn't have to be chaotic. You can do the 60s right, and this is an issue to do it about. This is 
I mean, you've heard some of these arguments. This is the way we can resolve the civil <coughs> rights movement. When people say, why does the war, why does this continue? My answer, John says, it's not about discrimination. It's not about individual discrimination, but it is about the maintenance of white privilege. The rate of incarceration in America was level from the 1920s to 1970. And it started, that rate of incarceration took off in 1970 and it hasn't stopped going up. What is, why is 1970 so historically important? Because it is that point that the civil rights movement triumphed. It's no longer lawful to discriminate you know, in education, in hiring, in housing, you know, in transportation, all the ways in which people were punished for the status of being colored in white society. Segregation was a form of punishment for being a deviant in white society, deviant being non-white. And that punishment was eliminated by the civil rights movement. Now, you remember that the civil rights movement was a very bloody struggle, it was resisted. And it was not somehow, oh right, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, okay, now we give up. We as whites benefit from white privilege. We benefit from white privilege. And part of that is we benefit on the street. We don't have to worry about being stopped and searched. When we think about the drug problem, the drug problem, well, that's an urban problem. When we think about youth at risk, our little mental thought balloon is, you know, some black kid. And yet, you saw the pot use rates are higher for whites for cocaine. White high school kids use cocaine at four times the rate black high school kids use cocaine. It is clear that the war on drugs doesn't do any of the things it's supposed to do. And my question then is, why is a policy that's so expensive? Why is a policy that is so resistant to change? There must be something that accomplishes. It doesn't stop kids from using drugs. It's not hurting the, the criminals from Colombia or Mexico. It does create an identity between the drug problem and people of color. When we think of the drug problem, that's a problem of the black people. That's what white people do. And so if I have to hire a black guy, well, maybe I better give him a very, very thorough drug test. They may need to check his criminal record. White privilege is maintained most strongly by the war on drugs. That's its social function in American society. And when we end it, we will have achieved the justice that we've been fighting for since the abolitionists started in the early 19th century. That's your mission. You can do the 60s right. And this is the field on which that battle has to be fought. I want to thank you. I want to thank Sabrina. I want to thank uh, Dee and everybody, uh, the people, Devin, the people from VCU, SSDP. Thank you all very much. This has been a fabulous one to thank you. You deserve a hand for that. <laughs> uh, I couldn't agree more. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you'll join us. We're having a reception at the Cary Street Cafe. Shortly after. Is that walking distance? It sure is. 2631 no, West no. Cary Street. Apparently it's not walking distance, but we can give you directions out by the table. It's a nice walk. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can please, I'd like to thank everyone who helped us bring this together. Uh, Robert Sharp, Christopher Live, Linda Burke, John Gibbon, Eric Sterling, Keith Strop, who had to leave a little bit early, especially Debbie Tackle and SSDP at VCU, phenomenal. Without these guys, I say I just want to reiterate, thank you all for coming out. I think we all know we're going to leave here a little bit more intelligent on drug policy. If you didn't, then you obviously weren't listening. Um, I think we got a shame to cut it short. We can sit here and listen to everyone talk all day. Um, it was really good. And I really enjoyed it. I'm just, you know, once again, thank you for coming out. Um, to all the students out there, um, don't let the act come stop in this room. Come to one of our meetings. We're actually meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock um, in the Commons, uh, the glass room at James River Terrace. Um, and to touch on what Eric was saying about watching the 10 rules for doing the police, I don't know if you mentioned it. it is on YouTube and you can watch it for free. But um, I suggest you come out. We're having a showing next month on Monday night. I can't remember the date right now. but. Um, we are showing the video. We've got a criminal justice professor from VCU. He's going to be there. He's going to be uh, answering your questions. And we also are going to have the 
VCU police chief or a high-ranking member of the VCU police there to answer your question as well. And we have another conference coming up here in the area on October 9th, this Saturday. It's uh, all day. It's um, from 11 p.m. or 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we have members from Drug Policy Alliance, um, SSDP National, uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which Eric works with, um, and uh, VCU Student Wellness uh, Center, as well as the VCU Police. So I suggest you come out on another great uh, drug policy reform conference. And you know, like I said, don't let the activism stop here. Go home, write your congressman, write your state representative, and uh, you know, come out with the, to the Care Street Cafe at night and have a